our next speaker is uh, Diane from Mytona. Uh, and Diane is going to talk about how to improve your game with your players uh, and using Cooking Diary as the case study. So, Diane, are you there? Hello, Diane. How are you Hi. doing? Hi. I will hand over to you and over to you. Thanks. Can you hear me well, just to check? I can hear first? you perfectly. Okay, great. So, hi everyone, my name is Diana, and today I would like to share with you one of interesting case on how we improved our game together with our players in Cooking Diary. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Diana Korkina, and I'm Business Development Manager at Maitona. I've joined Maitona in 2017, and if you have um, any questions or you want to chat or anything, you can contact me. The email is here. So uh, this is a short plan of what I'm going to talk today. At first, I will introduce my Tona and Cooking Diary, so you will have a little bit of context and then dive into details on ways on how to improve your game together with players through different tools available such as analysis, playlists, questionnaires, and reviews, and show some practical examples of how we did it in-game. Maitona is a developer and publisher of mobile games and one of the largest game development companies in Russia and CIS. Now we have more than 900 professionals working all around the world. Our offices are located in St. Petersburg, Ivanova, Yakutsk, Vladivostok, Singapore, and in Auckland, New Zealand. Hey, Diana, but now, just a quick question. Do you have, yep. are, you, are you trying to share your slides because they're not currently showing? Oh, wait. So if second. you look at the green button at the bottom, um, you, can, you can do a share screen. Sure. Can you see my screen? I can now, perfect. Oh, Thank okay, you. cool. <laughs> Sorry. And yeah, and with COVID-19, we uh, moved to 100% uh, work from home. But before the pandemic, we also had a distributed team working from different countries such as Brazil, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. So it was very easy for us to move to remote work. Our Yakutsk office has actually moved in a day, but this is a whole different topic. Uh, here you can see how the company developed through time. The company was founded in 2012 by twin brothers Afanasi and Alexey Ushnitsky in Yakutsk. This is where I'm actually located now, and this is one of the coldest inhabited places on earth. Just a fun fact. Uh, we started to create games back uh, in 2000s. It, it, at first it was PC games and in 2012 we moved to mobile games. The first game that we've developed and published ourselves is Seeker's Notes. The Seeker's, Seeker's Notes is a game in hidden object genre and it helped us grow, open up new projects and offices. Currently we have three games on global and two games on soft launch in our portfolio. There are Seeker's Notes, a game that for five years already is entertaining people around the world. Cooking Diary, the game I'm going to talk about today. Raven Hill, another game in the hidden object genre, but with a mix of Much 3. Riddle Side, a Much 3 game in a detective setting. And our first mid-core game, Mana Storm, Arena of Legends. So let me briefly talk about Cooking Diary. Um, in the game, players become chiefs who have to serve their clients as fast as possible. In game, uh, we have a lot of different restaurants with different styles and cuisines. Players can fully customize their restaurants and characters. By the way, that's me. I think I look quite familiar. <laughs> players enjoy the game because of its vivid and colorful art style and high socialization. Um, the game is popular all around the world and in deep blue you can see our key markets from where the most players are. This is United States, United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, France, South Korea, Canada and China. So the game is popular in the West and in the East. Also the game was featured several times on App Store and Google Play 
and we've also received the game of the day in more than 200 countries. But one of the biggest achievements that for me personally, that I believe is like outstanding for the game is uh, winning IMGA and Webby Awards in People's Choice and People's Voice nominations. This means that not only the honorable jury selected uh, our game, but it was our players who love and enjoy the game who voted for us to, to win this award. And how we did it, uh, you can see from the chart, the top grossing chart, that we gradually climbed it. There wasn't a moment when we had a rapid spike up or down, and we hope that this sustained growth won't stop, and with our players, we will steadily continue to grow. We have one rule that drives us, that is always, there is always some room for improvement, and we never stop developing and improving our game. But how to make players like us, and what we do more? I think uh, this is a question that haunts us all. And the answer to this question is a data-driven decision. How to get this data to know what to improve in game is another question. And the answer is through analysis, playtests, reviews, and questionnaires. I've highlighted um, these key ways that we've tried in our games, but you, of course, can find a lot of other ways that can suit you as well. So first one is analysis. I won't talk in great detail about analysis as I'm sure it is obvious and the most common practice and my colleagues on these tracks uh, will talk about it in greater detail. What I wanted to highlight is that analytics team uh, in a game development companies has two tasks. First, is to find a weak spot in game and to find a way to deal with it. They are like detectives who investigate the case and uh, try to eliminate it to make game better with the help of data. <clears throat> Let's move to playtests. There are several kinds of them. First one is uh, internal playtesting, when you can test a game with your colleagues, friends, or family. External playtesting, when you invite people to test the game. Here you can select your target audience. And outsource playtesting. Here I decided not to show examples, not to advertise companies here, but you can Google it yourself. Um, these companies can help you find uh, your profiling audience in a different countries, whereas with, with external playtesting, you are only limit you're, you're limited geographically. There are many outsourcing companies who provide an outstanding service. And uh, with internal playtests, it's very easy to run and ask your colleagues to play test the game. But because all of us are working uh, in, in game development and we play a lot of games ourselves, our behavior can differ a lot from our target audience and our feedback can also be biased. That's why, of course, it's better to run an external playtest. And that's how we did for our cooking diary. We invited people to play the game before it even soft launched. So <laughs> the player playtesters played one of the first builds of cooking diary and we selected all sorts of people. They they were different by age, gender, profession, background. And the main focus for our play test was the first session, at the top of all funnels. And we wanted to know how the introduction of the game begins. Uh, the better the first session, the better the whole lifetime of the player will be. We closely looked at the tutorials uh, if you're going to play test it, here you need to know that many people nowadays play games and um, a long and very detailed tutorial can bore players, whereas a very light tutorial can also be harmful as they won't understand on how some features work and churn. And so balancing the tutorial is crucial. Gameplay, uh, so it's 
very common. You just want to know to what extent player understands the goals of the game. Did they understand how they play the game? Do they agree with the rules of the game? Do they like the games generally? And do they like the dynamics of the game? UX UI, of course, is very important. Um, here on the photo, you can see how players position their hands closing some parts of the screen. And this is actually not really good because it might prevent them from seeing some user interface elements, some GUI. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind on where the buttons are located and how comfortable they are to use. And of course, balance. At first, your balance is based on mathematical calculations, on hypotheses. But during playtest, you can actually run your balance live for the first time. You will see the first live data, whether your balance is engaging and understanding. And of course, the most important thing that you will receive after playtest is hypotheses, the theories. By uh, understanding on how players engage with the game, you can build theories that you can later test during the soft launch. Let's now move to reviews. Reviews are the tools that most of us use during ASO optimization. Good reviews attract more players. The higher the review, the higher are the chances that players will convert and download the game. However, that's not it. There's a notion of useful information that you can get from players' reviews. You can check the dynamics of reviews. There are more or less of them after the update. This is a big actually signal for game that something has changed and a big advice here is to segment those reviews whether they're positive, negative or neutral. A surgeon reviews will help you understand whether the update was successful or not, whether a new feature was liked by players. Also, you can segment uh, reviews by words which were written more often and the other way around. And the best way is to segment them by topic. For example, you receive mixed reviews and by segmenting them by topic, you will understand, for example, that um, your players like the design, but they don't like the monetization that much. <laughs> this helps you to find weak spots in game and works towards solving them. So you don't need to change the whole game, just bits and pieces. And of course, reviews help you to identify technical problems. All of us have quality assurance, but sometimes it's hard to identify rare bugs. But with millions of players uh, who use wide array of devices and um, have countless of sessions, in few days you can identify those bugs, which even bug trackers can't, and solve them. Also, um, reviews are customer, user customer satisfaction. Uh, there is a lot of material in internet and how to work with customer satisfaction. And I think it's great to check it out and learn about it. And um, players' feedback is always important. In our company, we have a machine learning team. And this is an example of on how they help our support team to categorize the reviews by topic. The machine automatically places <clears throat> reviews according to the words in review. So like, uh, so if there is like words such as the guilds or upgrade or chat or help, this means that we have some technical problems and so on. This tagging helps to save time time and optimize support teams workflow. Of course, we don't stop here and we are always try to find more ways on how to optimize our workflow with machine learning, but it's a whole different topic and we can discuss it in another lecture. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is questionnaires. You can create questionnaires in game, or if you have a very strong social media, you can also do questionnaires there, like social media presence. What can you learn from questionnaires? It's a net promoter score, whether the players would recommend the game to others. You can get a valuable feedback from them again. It can also help you to run live ops, and I'm gonna show you 
an example later on how we did it in the game. And questionnaires also increase user loyalty. So with the help of surveys, players' loyalty towards the game increases. Players understand that their opinion is valued by the development team. And this is a very important aspect in building this long-term relationships. And yeah, so about the service on how to structure them, how to place them, you can find a lot of them in the internet and find the one that suits you, modify it and test it. This is an example of the survey we did in our social media in different languages. We asked our players who they like to see more in game from our NPCs, Chief Adam or Delivery Man Dave. Adam won the survey. He's my favorite character as well, actually. So I'm very happy. <laughs> and uh, we included him during our food truck event as a helper and players liked it a lot. They left a lot of positive comments and were happy to see their favorite character. By learning that Adam is liked by the majority of players, we included him in our other events, such as Sugar Rush, where Adam is the main character. So you help, need to help him to build the cake by not losing levels. The engagement rate of the event turned out to be quite high and everyone is happy. Second example of the survey in social media is when we asked our players to create the outfit which they would like to see in game. And our community went crazy. There were lots of like art created with different styles and uh, players voted a lot which one they want to see in game. And the winners are here. <laughs> On the left is the winner um, by our internal vote, the development choice, developer's choice. And on the right um, is the one that was chosen by players. So we recreated them in game. I think it looks pretty similar. And we decided to sell those outfits in offers. And players liked it a lot because it was our combined effort to create them. And the conversion of the offer with this outfit was 5%. We didn't stop here and a few days ago, we launched an, another questionnaire and we asked the players to, to, to draw the outfit. And uh, actually out of these three, the one who won was actually the right one. And uh, yeah, I, it received like lots of likes and everybody just had fun and we are now uh, trying to figure it out how it's going to look in game. And to summarize, uh, the opinion of players is sometimes bigger than the, your developer's opinion. And you shouldn't be afraid to ask your players. Do ask them what do they want to see, what they like and what they don't like in game. And work with data and make a data-driven decisions. Thank you, that's all from me for today. Thank you very much, that was fantastic. Yeah, I, I mean, I am a big fan of Net Promoter Score. I never used to be, and I suddenly got it with one of our clients, um, it's a, a large corporate doing a learning game, uh, but they wanna do it as a live ops, and they're obsessed with Net Promoter Score, and I suddenly, it's, it's worked for me. This idea of somebody asking someone a simple question like, would you recommend us? I know that sounds stupid, but the fact that you mentioned it really, I think, just shows how powerful this, this question is. Um, and, and I think also the point you made about um, if you ask people their opinions, you're going to naturally affect their uh, desire to, to work, you know, to play your game more. The one question that raises, though, I think, is how, how does that affect the reliability of their responses? Because if you're building up a rapport with someone by asking them questions, is that going to mean that they become less useful to ask them more questions? The reason I'm asking is because if they're biased towards you, you're not necessarily going to get an honest, a truly honest, reflective answer that the rest of the community are not as bonded will say. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I, I think I understood uh, your question. And the answer is that you have to segment your players as well. So uh, if it's a new player who, who left a review, it goes in, into one cohort, in one funnel. And if it's like the player who plays like for a year and like pays regularly, this is another one. This is another group. And uh, as, as long as you receive those feedback from your players, you can categorize them and decide which one is like, which feedback you should take into consideration and actually implement in the game. Yeah, and I think I think you nailed it on the head there. I and mean, the key thing for me is, you know, understanding how we, you know, which which players we're talking about. You know, how do we set up cohorts and data? How do we compare like with like? Because I think it's very easy for. I mean, I know it's a stupid thing, but the simplest thing I learned was just ranking people uh, in terms of the number of days since they first played together. Because if I if I was looking at a snapshot across the board, it's meaningless. But if I know that this person is in day three of playing, as opposed to that person over there is day 100 of playing, that simple, simple measure is so revealing in terms of what their answers are. Uh, and it has so many layers of information that go with those simple cohorts. So I mean, do you have any tips for people about cohorts uh, and why, why they're useful? Well, Actually, you have to do please use cohorts. Yeah. You can, you, this is the, the simplest advice. You, yeah. can, you can do it any, anyhow. Like the imagine, just ima your imagination is the limit. You can yeah. just like the, how, how long they played. Did they try this event or did they not? Like when did they, they made a purchase or the, like it, the limitless possibilities on on building the cohorts. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when I, I'm, I've been asked to do reviews for um, some uh, Chinese studios uh, in the past uh, few months, and um, one of the things I've been doing is um, I've been doing breakdown based on the retention. So you know, day one, day three, day seven users, day thirty users, day ninety users, that kind of thing. But I also found it interesting to break down in terms of spending cohorts. So completely different. Uh, here's non-spenders. Here's people who spend uh, the smallest 25% of audience. And then there's, of, you know, of those people who spend is the, you know, the, the, the highest 25% of all, you know, that quartile model. And I found it's really fascinating when you look at, you know, behavioral data over time versus behavioral data by spend. So any kind of combination of how you can slice and dice your players, I think really is powerful. Um, so again, I think it's really interesting is like observing how they're, in, how you engaging with them changes where they are in those cohorts. I think actually it's one of the things I, th I find fascinating. Um, anyway, we've probably gone too much on cohorts. Uh, Marcus here uh, on, uh, uh, Marcus Dernan, um, he was saying he's observed that um, quite a lot of YouTubers in games um, do reaction videos. Um, and it, his impression, and I'm not sure if I agree or not, I'm, I'm still, my, the jury's out for me, but I think there's a there's some truth in it. Um, their initial reactions are often very honest, especially where you know they've not been paid by somebody to give it, uh, because of course they're an authentic um, spokesperson, uh, you know, influencer, they have an audience. Have you looked at using that kind of reaction as a, a source of data? Actually, we don't receive that many like YouTube observations because this is a like this is a very casual game, and uh, uh, like the reviews are often on YouTube are often le left uh, from players who do play like midcore and hardcore games. They they do it more often, and um, I'm not really sure that if like if we received a little number of it on how like whether we actually even took it into account but actually i've seen some just videos that show the gameplay of the game yeah. but they were not actually commented that much yeah no and actually i think um where i, I have seen youtubers doing commentaries on uh, specific games um and i think that that can be really powerful uh, and even casual games uh, but they tend to be people who've been playing the game for a while 
Um, because this isn't to me, I mean, this isn't classic. You let's play fodder. This is a, a game that you play and you engage and you build and you build and you build. You're not going to play time and time again and restart. And I think let's plays need the ability to restart to be able to get that kind of entertainment because I don't think you get the I don't know, maybe it depends on the YouTuber, but anyway, the, the thing, I suppose the point I, I'm saying is it's really interesting seeing how you get this different types of audiences reacting in different ways and we use whatever data we can get but i think probably the biggest issue you've highlighted there is that you can't guarantee that any any influencer is going to play your game um and the only way to guarantee it is to pay them and then you, you've ruined yeah. the point anyway. <laughs> um so uh ollie uh our next speaker who's oliver kern who's a fantastic guy who knows all about live ops um uh he's asking here how do you remove positive bias in play tests for example, um, if you ask friends and family, or if you ask someone in the in the industry, for example, who knows you, you're going to get them having couching their response because you, they, you're going to affect. They, you know, they're going to want to not annoy you. They've got a relationship with you. They don't want you to feel depressed. How do you get them to give you the brutal, hard, vicious responses that you need <laughs> to make the right choices? That, that, that's why I'm not actually um, advising you to rely on the internal playtest. It's always better to do the external. It's always better to actually even ask an outsource company to do it for you because they, if you, with an external playtest, you can actually ask somebody like, I'm based in Russia, just a Russian person to come in and play the game. But uh, the geographically, Russians players behavior is completely different from the from your target audience, which is the United States and yeah. and other countries, so yeah, it's you. You always have to take it with a grain of salt, and just uh, just try to categorize it again. So if um, many of your friends said like the game is great, the gameplay is great, but I actually uh, just played it for two minutes, that that that's also a signal that's yeah. That and, and I think yeah, there's a whole bunch of techniques that I try to look at. Well, so first thing, I'm, I look at sentiment analysis uh, in terms of looking at what people have said, but I compare it with what the data of what they actually did, and that's a big reveal. But I also, I, I look at asking different questions at different stages. So if I am at the mechanic design stage, I'm asking questions like, is this fun? If I'm at the context loop, so the kind of like the purpose and progression stage of the design, I'm asking, do they stay playing it? If I get to the meta game, I'm looking for, do they scale? So I will, I will involve um, people who are close to me in the first stage, but I'll generally try to get people who I know understand games and trust me enough that I won't hate them if they tell me my game's shit. Uh, I've got a couple of friends of mine who are really good at telling me my games are shit. <laughs> and I love them for it. Uh, we all need those friends. <laughs> oh, you need those friends so badly. Um, I mean, particularly for me, it's like, it's the sort of heartache. It's the, it's the holding truth is a painful process. Uh, but we're going to learn to love it. We're going to build up the calluses for it. And it's heartbreaking every time it happens. But I, I know we need it. So that, that matters to me. Uh, and to, so to me, it's about breaking up and asking, what is the question I want to answer? And is that audience, that segment, the right one to answer it? I don't know if that answers on his question, but um, at least that's that's my take on it. I know he has his own views on this, by the way. So um, <laughs> you know, he, I, he'll have an opportunity to talk about that in a few seconds. So, um, so I suppose the last sort of question for you is: What was the one bit of advice you'd give to people who are going to take their game forward into live ops? What's the one thing they should be considering? Make a data-driven decisions. Make data. Uh, sounds good to me <laughs> and on that note i'm going to say thank you very much diana that was fantastic i by the way i love the curve you showed it was to me the perfect live ops curve of um, how a, a game should sustain as a constant gradual growth um which is so rare and so hard to achieve and uh, congratulations to you guys on doing that